everyone, my name is Eloise and I am one of the presidents of History Society uh, for the coming year. Um, and I delivered this talk last Wednesday at History Society, uh, but because of masks the audio didn't quite work out. So I'm re-recording it now and hopefully it will uh, be a bit better. Um, so the title of the talk is The Three Women of China. And this is to celebrate uh, International Women's History Month, which is the whole month of March. And uh, last week on Monday was International Women's Day. Uh, so this is kind of a one-off uh, special to celebrate women in history. So the three women that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, their names are Mei Ling, Ai Ling and Qing Ling. And the surname is Soong, but um, kind of with the traditional uh way that Chinese names are put together, uh, it would be said as in Sung Mei Ling, Sung Ai Ling, Sung Qing Ling, but because their legal names are as they're written in the presentation, uh, that's kind of how uh, scholars and historians refer to them. Um, so it's not immediately obvious from the picture because it's in black and white, but uh, Mei Ling on the left is the youngest, Ai Ling the oldest, and Qing Ling the uh, middle child, but um, there's only a few years between them, so it's kind of only a marginal difference. Um, but these are three women who are kind of extremely important in building the modern China that we know today, and they go unwritten in the history books and don't really get the recognition that they deserve, which is why I decided to do this talk about them. So first to kind of get understand the role that they played in uh, the development of modern China, you have to understand uh, about the basic history. Um, and it was a very turbulent century for China, the 20th century, a lot going on and a lot of shift in power. So it's kind of complex to get your head around, but hopefully this will make sense. So in 1911, you have the fall of the Qing dynasty. And that's the end of imperialism in China, which uh, scholars kind of date back to 250 BC, and this is the end of it. Um, and the last le uh, emperor in the Qing dynasty was, uh, his name was Pu Yi, and he was kind of nicknamed the boy emperor. And essentially he was ineffectual, he wasn't running um, the country well, and so it left a space open and the new Chinese Republic was founded under a man called Sun Yat-sen and you can see his picture on the left and he also founded the Kuomintang party and so this new republic had national nationalist uh, values and above all didn't want the reinstatement of the monarchy but unfortunately in 1911 kind of facing th uh, many threats uh, against his life Sun Yat-sen had to resign and go into hiding in Japan so at that point um, uh, a guy called Yuan took over and his kind of primary aim was subverting everything that Sun Yat-sen had fought for and he wanted to re-establish the monarchy um, but because of a lack of support a uh, lack of funds and general incompetence he was not successful and between 1911 and 1925 you kind of got a period of um, time where different warlords fought over uh, control in various provinces, but there was kind of no centralised um, government and it was a bit chaotic. So in 1925, um, we have another kind of claim of power. And this time it's uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who's a, kind of a bigger name. And his photo is the uh, middle photo. And he was Sun Yat-sen's predecessor in the Kuomintang party. Um, and although he wasn't technically a dictator in the beginning, he did call himself um, Generalissimo Supreme, which is interesting. And you can see that he's decked out in his full military attire. So that was very much his uh, prerogative. Um, and between 1925 and the outbreak of civil war in 1949, China had... Uh, a really uh, flourishing democracy in fact there was free press uh, free speech um, development in literature and the arts um, a lot of development academically and uh, overall China was kind of flourishing over uh, effective 
um, but not um, tyrannical government. And after this kind of democratic age, in 1949, we have uh, the Mao seizing power uh, in the name of communism and declaring the People's Republic of China. And three years uh, prior to this, uh, the civil war began. Mao embarks on his long march, which was a physical march across China um, to seize power of the nationalist um, headquarters. And Chiang Kai-shek is forced to retreat to Taiwan with his uh, kind of founding nationalists and the communists take over the entirety of China, declaring it the People's Republic of China. So then from 1949 until 1976, you have a period of really hardcore communism in China under Mao. And Mao is a, a and Mao's on the right and he's a... Um, He's the head of state, but he's so much more than that. He um, took after Lenin in establishing, and Stalin, in fact, in establishing his um, cult of personality, and he absolutely revered um, and indoctrinated the people of China to hold him as their kind of ultimate supreme leader. But then in 1976, uh, Mao dies of completely natural reasons. As you can see, he's been around for a long time, um, and I believe it was a form of cancer that eventually took him. But following this, his uh, one of his advisors, Deng Xiaoping, uh, takes over and he begins to reform uh, China greatly. Um, so he uh, kind of frees up the market and takes away uh, some of the um, collectivist principles and takes away some of the state um, support that kind of keeps communism running as it did so for the years beforehand um, and this is kind of where we see the China that we know today that's um, friendly with other states well to an extent um, and has a flourishing and free economy so that's kind of the history of China that you need to know to be able to slot um, these women in appropriately so the reason I found out about the Soong sisters is this book uh, called Big Sister, Little Sister, Red Sister by Jung Chang, who's a fantastic author. Or author. I would recommend any of her books, um, and particularly Wild Swans if you're interested in feminist history. Um, that was her first book, and it's about, um, it's kind of the story of uh, the 20th century um, China, but told through this perspective of three women, except this time it's through her grandmother, her mother and uh, herself. So you get that kind of personal account. And then she also has a biography of Mao that she wrote with her husband, which is good. It's interesting, but it's very, very long. And a biography of Empress Dowager Sixi, um, who, if you remember, I mentioned about the um, boy emperor, who's the last emperor in the Qing dynasty. Um, and before that, um, she was the empress of China before Pu Yi came of age. And she did kind of fantastic things to improve the economy of China and push it into the uh, 20th century rather than keeping it fully agricultural and um, feudal. So on to the three women themselves. And before I kind of go into, into the specifics of each one, something that's really important in the development of all three women is the education which they received. So um, in China at the time, the culture still really um, expected that it was only the sons of rich um, men who would receive an education and women and poorer boys were kind of exempt from this and it wasn't something that we pursued. Uh, but these three girls were extremely fortunate in that they were able to uh, attend school in America where kind of educational horizons were far broader. And actually, when I looked up the college that they all attended, it's this one, Wesleyan Female College, uh, which is, or that's what it was called at the time, now it's just Wesleyan College, uh, which is in Georgia. And this uh, college proclaims the factual evidence I can't find out if it actually supports it or not was the wor world's first college um, chartered to grant women's degrees so actually if that is true that is an it, 
the the college itself is extremely seminal uh, for women's rights and women in history. Um, but while they did all attend uh, college in America, after receiving their education, uh, they did all three of them came back to China. So I'm going to talk about Ching Ling, who is the middle sister or the red sister first, which might seem a bit weird, but given the chronology, it just works out better that way. So she married Sun Yat-sen in 1915, and you might remember Sun Yat-sen was the very first person to overthrow the Qing dynasty and uh, make China a republic. Um, and during that time, she acted um, giving advice to him, um, being involved very much as the first the first, first lady of China. Um, and she was extremely useful to him. But then after his death, which was uh, just before 19, the 1925 overthrow by Chiang Kai-shek, she became a passionate communist, which... Uh, might seem surprising given that uh, going forward it would be the Sun Yat-sen's party, the uh, Kuomintang, who would face off against the communists. But to understand that, um, it's important to know that the in the 1925 um, takeover by the Chiang Kai-shek, it was very much a joint effort from the uh, nationalists and communists. And... Uh, they received uh, money from Russia through the com- Comintern. Um, and so therefore Ching Ling felt that she was, you know, um, Sun Yat-sen was equally uh, part of the Communist Party as he was a nationalist. Um, and she decided that the communists were more important and more representative of her husband. Um, and she was ostracised by her family for this decision. Um, it was a feud that kind of would never be resolved. Her sisters didn't attend her funeral, uh, both because they weren't allowed, but I also get the impression that they probably wouldn't have wanted to. Um, but having kind of cemented herself into the Communist Party, although she had to maintain herself as a secret communist for a long time, um, because it was so important for her to retain the um title of being Madame Sun Yat-sen as opposed to just another communist. Um, But once she had established herself, she held extremely prominent roles in the People's Republic of China. Um, She was a vice chairperson of the committee to advise Mao. That's probably the highest position she held. Um, But she was on that um, committee for a very long time and had a close personal relationship with Mao himself. So these are just a few pictures of her. Um, so on the right, you can see that she's delivering a speech. I couldn't find out actually where that was, but um, nonetheless, you can see that she's kind of in the lectern and uh, confident in what she's delivering. And then the two pictures on the left, I thought were interesting because you can see uh, just her proximity to Mao. Um, and if anyone's interested in period in history of the time, in the bottom picture on the left you've got Khrushchev and then you have Mao and then you have Ho Chi Minh so you can tell that's an extremely um, important dinner happening there but um, not only do these pictures demonstrate how close she was and how powerful she was in the Communist Party but you can also see that it's a total boys club you know there's not another woman in sight and um, it almost seems anachronistic seeing a woman in such a high uh, position of power at that t- that time, but it shows you just how important it is, uh, she was and how silly it is that she's not remembered. So then moving on to Mei Ling, who's um, the youngest sister, and um, she married Chiang Kai-shek in 1927, and it was, uh, upon all accounts, a marriage of love, not kind of for political convenience. Um And she held many kind of official positions in the government and she held uh, great influence during both the Civil War and World War II. Um, Most importantly, I think, especially in terms of women's rights, she launched many social welfare projects that um, aimed to help uh, children who had been orphaned from either the Civil War or or World War II. Um, And as well, she set up the Chinese Women's National War Relief Society, which helped to uh, um, support those women who had also lost their husbands in the combat. And 
she was secretary and advisor to her husband and you know secretary it sounds like a very demeaning term but because she um understood uh, both the culture of um america and obviously spoke english well and understood um many academic um concepts because her education was so good um she kind of shone as opposed to her husband on an international front um because although Chiang Kai-shek was a great kind of military advisor, he lacked the poise to um, present himself politically and also his um, kind of lack of language on complex terms proved problematic. Um, So I have a great example where um, in a meeting with President Roosevelt, uh, though it was meant to be, and other uh, world leaders in fact, there was uh, Chiang Kai-shek representing China because of his kind of lack of ability to be involved in the conversation um Mei Ling had gone as his translator but eventually she kind of ended up just um being a part of the and being the representative for China herself which is you know well technically probably not correct way to go about things uh quite funny and uh just demonstrates her political capabilities And she also conducted an eight-month speaking tour of America and represented the Republic in many um, foreign policy issues because she was so skilled in politics and uh, she was so um, educated. So there you can see she's on the left, she's doing some kind of radio interview for NBC, an American network. And then on the top right, you have a picture of her delivering a speech and uh, she's alongside uh, Roosevelt there. And the flag in the background is the United States flag. And it's actually in the Senate House, which tells you kind of just how prominent she was. And then on the bottom right, you can see her around um, a group of women there. Presumably she's uh, this is part of her social welfare program and you can see just how appreciative they are and finally the last sister Ailing, who um is probably politically the least prolific and um, prolific and then we move on to Ailing, who was um the oldest sister and she was probably the least politically prolific but um still interesting nonetheless and she was a close confidant and secretary to Sun Yat-sen actually before Qingling that was how the two of them met and she continued to offer advice and kind of severely influence his opinion uh, up until his death and then as sister to Mei Ling and the wife of a key governmental minister she held great political sway before the communist takeover. Along the way she became a hugely successful businesswoman and we're kind of not talking uh, just comparably considering she was a woman at the time or anything like that she was truly uh, immensely wealthy through her business um, and she also married one of the richest men in China who was a banker which didn't uh, hurt but she was also extremely successful in her own right and she also um, much like her sister used some of this wealth to help greatly with the war efforts and with social welfare um, after the communist takeover, she moved with the other nationalists to uh, Taiwan, but there she faced claims of corruption and she eventually moved to America and did not come back. Hence why neither her nor Mei Ling, who also moved to America after her husband's death, were allowed at the funeral of their sister. So the question then is, why are these sisters so easily forgotten if they're clearly so Uh, important in modern Chinese history. So the obvious answer is that they find themselves overshadowed by the men in their lives. And you may be thinking uh, quite justifiably that perhaps that's, you know, appropriate because at the end of the day it was their husbands who held the positions, not them. But if you think comparably kind of how many uh, United States first ladies that you could name um Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Jackie Kennedy, obviously um more recent times Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton. The list goes on and yet we kind of are totally unaware of these women who were more than just a face and more than just a wife, but actually politicians and history makers in themselves. 
And then the second issue is kind of that of the uh, restrictions that communism in China placed on the correct uh, recording of history at the time. And because uh, the girls, um, the women, found themselves uh, so wealthy, um, you know, they not everyone could afford to go to boarding school in America, and Ailey in particular obviously generated such a huge fortune, they were condemned as rightists, and there's kind of uh, folklore in uh, Chinese culture, certainly during the communist period, that uh, Mei Ling, the wife of Chiang Kai-shek, would buy, bathe in milk, which demonstrated just how wasteful and um, uh, indulgent she was. And then... The other reason is because the period between uh, 1925 until the Civil War was a period in which democracy flourished so well and by all accounts things were looking like they were going to go very well for China. Um, The communists didn't really want people to remember that time in which there was free speech and free press and people's lives weren't so restricted so they kept that out of history whilst it was being recorded. And that's also a big reason why uh, not only they, but that whole period of history is often forgotten. Um, So, yeah, that's the end of the speech. Hopefully you enjoyed. uh, Maybe it's an introduction to Chinese history for you, or nonetheless, just to hear about these women um, who were so monumental in the development and making of 20th century China. So thank you very much.